Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers. If you would, stand with us, and as we sing, I will call upon the Lord. This is a round, so guys, you sing the first part. The ladies will sing the second part, okay? Here we go. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. I will call upon the Lord. Do it again. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. Shall I be saved from my enemies? I will call upon the Lord. Here we go. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And one more time. Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Our next song is Find Us Faithful. Find us faithful, may the fire of our devotion light their way, may the footprints that we leave, lead them to believe, and the lives we live inspire them to obey, oh may all who come behind us find us faithful. Amen, I believe. Hopefully we can sing that song and we can see that come to fruition in our lives through our children and grandchildren. Amen. And if we're faithful and establish that pattern of faithfulness, it's amazing how that just kind of filters down. And uh, so we're thankful for that this morning. Let's look, Lord, in prayer this morning. Just ask his blessing on the service as we get started. Andy, you want to start this morning, please? Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We are glad that you are here today. And we do need to have a little celebration this morning. So uh, let me ask this first of all. If you are a father today, would you stand for us please this morning? If you are a good old dad. All right. Good. Give them a hand first of all. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. You can be seated. We appreciate you being here with us on Father's Day. If you are with that person and you are a child, make sure you give that dad a nice gift today. Amen. Amen. You know the difference between Mother's Day and Father's Day? The size of the gift. <laughs> Always. But anyways, uh, dads, you play an important role in the lives of children. I really believe that with all my heart. And uh, many of the uh, situations we find our country in today is due to fatherless homes. And, and so I want to encourage you dads today, uh, just keep on doing what the Lord's called you to do. Be a good dad, good grandpa, whatever you may find yourself at right now or heading towards. Uh, do, do all that you can for the glory of God. Amen. And uh, be the father that you ought to be. We thank you for being here with us today on Father's Day. Uh, just so that you know, we do have a nice gift for you, a, ni a nice parting prize, if you will, on the way out. Uh, I've, I'll meet you in the lobby out there, dads, on the way out. Don't forget to stop. You're not going to want to miss the gift today, all right? We've got a, a nice coupon for you for a free, absolutely free, two-topping Sunday uh, down at the old Benson Ice Cream Shop, all right? Won't cost you a dime. Uh, I recommend the maple syrup and bacon. Woo! Glory! 
It is good, good stuff, all right? And so, dads, make sure you get one of those, and uh, we're happy to honor you with that. We look, we look for every year to try to do something different with gifts. We've given out a variety of different things, and I thought that would be a fabulous gift this year. I'm going to take two for myself, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to have a maple with bacon and a bacon with maple. Uh, so anyways, but uh, so make sure you stop by and get uh, one of those for me, and uh, we appreciate you getting here being with us today and appreciate the ice cream shop as well, uh, helping us with those uh, uh, gifts to give out, so appreciate that very much. If you don't get to town much, make sure you bring it when you come to town and use it. Uh, You'll be glad that you did, all right? Uh, So thank you again for being with us. Please be sure to grab your gift on the way out. Uh, Secondly, I I know we have several, but if you're visiting with us for the first time today, would you do this? Just slip your hand up. We just, we're not going to make you give a speech or anything, I promise. Uh, We just want to give you a little guest card, and uh, we want to connect with you a little bit. And uh, he's coming around with those. If you'll do this, if you'll just fill out the card and hang on to it, and at the end of the service, again, I'll be in the lobby. I'll take that card and give you another gift, all right? So if you're a father, you're going to get two gifts today if you're visiting. And, uh, but it's a nice little gift, just some thank yous for being with us in church today. And a lot of places you could have decided to go, and you stopped and visited with us, and we appreciate that. We have, we have one couple here all the way from Virginia, and they came just to hear me preach. <laughs> are, are, isn't that exciting? That's exciting. Actually, I found out they came, they came for the Gaslight Theater, and they're having to hear me preach. <laughs> but, uh, I'm kidding. but it's good to have them, Sylvia's friends there. And uh, did you get the, uh, the couple here, Roger? Yep, got in the back row? Okay, we're good. You're good. You're good. Good job, Roger. <laughs> we, we did take uh, several of our men axe throwing yesterday after breakfast. And just so everybody knows, Roger was not as good as he was last year. So I, I got to point it out, Roger, you had a little slip off. So next time we come back, I expect you to bump up your game a little bit, all right? But uh, we had a couple other guys do a, a really, really excellent job. I heard down at the other lane that Frank, where's Frank at? Frank was doing really good, hitting that bullseye. And Lynn, Lynn, I don't know, some got into him. He got this little private mini session with the trainer, the instructor that teaches how to throw. He's like, dude, I need some help. And the guy helped him for like 30 seconds. And Lynn all of a sudden just said, bullseye, 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 bullseye. <laughs> And I was like, man, that's cheating. <laughs> but we had, a, we had a blast. And if you didn't get to go, we'll go again uh, down the road here. But uh, had, a, had a wonderful time with our men out uh, yesterday. Had a lot of fun with that. So I encourage you to come out next time. Uh, just a couple things uh, before Kathy comes because she doesn't know this yet. Uh, next Sunday we'll have a baby dedication planned. And so I encourage you to be out for that next Sunday. And then we have another one planned in August, the end of August. So uh, looking forward to that as well. And so remember that. And then uh, our service tonight will be recessed for Father's Day. Uh, we did this for Mother's Day as well just to give you a chance. If, you've, if you're near your dad or close to your dad or your family's close, just spend some time with your family tonight. Uh, I know that's a blessing. Uh, and spend, spend time with you while you have them. Amen. And uh, so I want to encourage you to do that this evening. So we will not have our regular 6 o'clock service tonight, and then we'll just be back Wednesday uh, at 7 for, for that. So, Kathy, you come, and you can make the rest of our announcements. All right. Well, I, too, want to wish all you dads happy Father's Day. It's a wonderful day to celebrate you. I, I do have a question, though, about that gift they're going to get. I wonder if you can order that Sunday with two spoons. Oh, never mind. (laughs) Let's look at our announcements this morning. Uh, We're enjoying the uh, fear-free evangelism class that pastor's teaching uh, here at the Sunday School Hour on Sunday morning. That's going to go through at least through next Sunday. Uh, It's been very good, and it's for teens and adults. Uh, There's also the sign-up sheet in the lobby for the growth groups. Be sure and sign up uh, uh, for one of those groups. Uh, It's going to be on Wednesday night. That's going to be in our Wednesday night classes, and it's going to start on the 29th of June and go through August 3rd. It'll be 6.30 to 8 on Wednesday evening. There will be a light meal at 6.30, and then the class will start 7 and run until 8 o'clock, and you need to sign up for that. Uh, Friday Night Fellowship is coming up on the 24th. It's coming Friday at 6 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall, and that's going to be hosted by Bonnie. So bring a dish to share and come enjoy, enjoy the evening. A help out day, look at that note. Um, There are several jobs that need to be done, some maintenance things and uh, repair jobs that need to be done here at the church and they're listed on a sign up sheet out in the lobby. Uh, Read over that sign up sheet and see what what you would be uh, interested in helping do. Uh, Our church always needs some little 
upgrading and some repairs and maybe there are jobs that you can do by yourself or maybe it's going to be a group project that you need to get some of your buddies to help you with but there are uh, all different levels of jobs so uh, take a look at that list and sign up the work time is going to be Saturday the 25th starting at 6 o'clock a.m. and uh, but if there are jobs that you can do at other times during the week I feel free to do that at that time also the note about the directories we have a wonderful directory for the uh, people here in the church but we update it every now and then and there's a copy on the table uh, also with a red pen so read over your information and if there are any changes that need to be done use that red pen to make those changes and then if you're not listed in our directory we want you to be there so uh, on the back sheet there are some blank sheets and just write your information and then if uh, you want your picture to be taken, which you do, let me tell you, you do. We want your picture in that directory. <laughs> See Terry after the service, and he'll take your uh, picture for that. Uh, birthdays and anniversaries are there. The nursery volunteers for this week and next are there. And um, also I wanted to mention that Wednesday service is at 7, but there's also a note there that um, if you have a, a prayer request, there's an email address for you to uh, Tell us what your prayer requests are and be sure and let people know what your requests are. We need to be praying for you. Our next hymn is I Am a Man. And before we start, this is the men, a song for the men, this thing. It's not just a song. It is a proclamation. So, guys, if you would, let's stand up, if you can. The words will be on the screen. And let's sing it, okay? Lord, fill me now and help me see 
who walks with men as friend. I'll be a man who loves and serves his family. I'll be a man on whom God can depend. Lord Jesus Christ, my King and my Commander, I'll be your man until my life shall end. Thank you, man. Thank you. Our next song is Faith of Our Fathers in 404. The words will be on the screen. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sore. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our Next song is How Firm a Foundation. We will sing all four verses. <clears throat> How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What that 
that so through all hell should endeavor to shake. I'll know never, no, never, no, never forsake. This is a song that I think that all of you know, if at least most of you. And if you can sing in the basement with me, I'd like you to sing with me. <laughs> There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. life's ebb and flow. Thus, Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings stirred my slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting neath his sheltering wings, Always looking on his smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know my every longing keeps me singing as I go. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our junior church kids at this time. They're going to make their way across the way there. We'll see them back in a few minutes. While they're heading out, I don't know who these are from, but thank you for the socks. I'm assuming those are mine. They were on my chair, so thank you. Appreciate that. I have my, I'm not even attempting to put my leg up there today, but I have my uh, Darth Vader, <laughs> world's best dad on there. So, yeah. So, anyways, if I can get my pant leg down, to, you know who Darth Vader's wife is, right? Ella. Elevator. <laughs> that is so good. Anyways, we're glad, we're glad you're here. Um, let me do make mention of just one quick thing. Uh, Kathy had mentioned in our announcements with our Wednesday night growth groups changing the end of the month on the 29th. Um, if you don't usually come on Wednesday nights, this is just a, a, a different opportunity opportunity is a unique thing that we're doing we don't typically do this it's just a change that we're trying to see how it goes um, and, and basically that Wednesday night is going to be a discussion 
and a round table type of deal in smaller groups uh, to discuss some of the things brought out on Sunday morning uh, to help us further understand and get a little deeper with them. So uh, we encourage you, if you don't usually come on Wednesday, just come and try them, see if you like it, and we'd love to have you, and it'll be a good experience. Just a six-week t- uh, timetable is all that's going to be, and then we'll go from there on what happens. But uh, we encourage you to come out. You probably had some of our Wednesday night crowd, if you don't usually come, probably at you trying to get you to come. I challenged them to get some new folks. So, uh, But you got another week or so to sign up. Uh, if you would help me with this, uh, whether you're new or you're regularly coming and have already signed up too, I mentioned it Wednesday, but if you maybe put like a little star beside your name if you plan to come to our dinner at 6.30, it's not required. It's just trying to help some of those. Maybe you might be coming in right from work or something like that. Uh, give them a quick meal before we, before we get into our, uh, our, our group. So uh, if you're going to come for a meal, just make sure that you denote that so that we do know. Please, we appreciate that. Uh, very much. All right, Acts chapter number 18, please, this morning. Acts chapter number 18. I uh, typically for Father's Day will, Mother's Day will come up with a message geared towards mothers or fathers, and the other person just has to kind of listen. And I try to make it applicable for everybody. But as I was preparing for our uh, Father's Day service this week and the message for this week, I couldn't help but think how troubled our nation is today because of the lack of fatherhood and much of that is attributed to the fact that many times men or people in general just give up we, we quit trying we quit trying to build our marriages we quit trying to rear, rear and raise our children properly we quit trying to uh, stand for God we we quit we quit we quit and we become a generation of quitters and so this morning I want to challenge yes our men I think this is so important for our men But this is for everybody this morning. Uh, I want to challenge us to understand a very simple truth, and that is this. It is too soon to quit. You say, well, you don't know how long it's been. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It's too soon to quit. And and I want to challenge us from the life of the Apostle Paul this morning. And we're going to go to Acts chapter number 18. And uh, if you've got a Bible, you can follow along. If not, it'll be up here on the screen here for you. But stand with me, if you will, out of uh, respect for the reading of God's Word. And we'll read just the first 11 verses together. And then I'll make my prayer and you can be seated. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, they were all tent makers, uh, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered in a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the oh, we'll get switch. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God. Among them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your love and goodness. Thank you for the time we've had to be in your house and to sing praise to your name, Lord, and and just worship you today. We thank you for that opportunity, that privilege, that freedom. And uh, we ask you now as we open your word for the next few minutes that you will bless the time of preaching. Uh, May it be helpful to us, encouraging to us, even challenging to us, Lord, to the men as well as to the others that are here and listening. Uh, Lord, just use the message to hit its mark. Uh, Encourage us, Lord, in this area. Challenge us not to quit. Uh, but to keep on whatever situation you put us in and uh, wherever we find ourselves in life, but may we continue living for you and uh, putting you first, Lord, and, and allowing you to accomplish your will in our lives, I pray. Father, as always, we ask if there's one here in our service that does not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Lord, we pray today would be the day they recognize their need for you, your love for them, and they would trust you today, I pray. Uh, we thank you again for the time we've already had. We ask you now to bless the remaining time, this time of preaching. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. It was January 31st, 1993. Super Bowl 27. 
my Dallas Cowboys were on their way to beating the Buffalo Bills 52-17 to and win the second of their third Super Bowl in a row. That game, they forced nine turnovers. In the fourth quarter, one of their defensive backs, Leon Lett, defensive lineman, forced a fumble at the 45-yard line. He scooped up the ball, and if you know anything about defensive linemen, they're not the most agile guys. They're the big dudes. He scooped up the ball and ran 60 yards. He had a 10-yard lead on any Buffalo player chasing him. He's almost ready to score another touchdown for the Dallas Cowboys. And right before he crossed the goal line, he held out his arm and celebrated. And Don Beebe of the Buffalo Bills caught him and stripped the ball. And it went out of the back of the end zone. And Buffalo got the ball back. The Cowboys still won the game, 52-17. But that touchdown uh, made them fail to make history in five or six different categories. All because Leon Lett quit too soon. Quit too soon. There are time and time again in, in, in history, uh, in sports and events, uh, where people just quit too soon. There was a jockey in 2005 that 80 yards before the finish line, he saw the finish poles and uh, saw a different set of poles and thought they were the finish line and stood up and began to celebrate and lost. Uh, athletes uh, running the, uh, the races and begin to celebrate just very at the last minute and somebody passes them at the very last second because they quit too soon. Uh, University of Oregon runner, 400 meter race, almost to the finish line. And right at the finish line, he started to, to wave and pump up the crowd. And a University of Washington runner passed him and won by one-tenth of a second. 27 times in professional football. The ball has been dropped before the goal line since 2005. 27 times just before the goal line, the ball was dropped before they entered. No touchdown. They quit too soon. 13 times in college football since 2013, the same thing has happened. Drop the ball before the goal line. No touchdown. They quit too soon. I look at this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter number 18. And I see a tremendous man of God, the Apostle Paul. I see him. He's on his second missionary journey here. The second missionary journey is coming to a close. As the text begins, he is departing from Athens and he's heading to the town of Corinth. Corinth, if you know anything about history in this day, was a town known for its debauchery. Corinth was a wicked, wicked town. Uh, if you wanted to describe somebody who was just a wicked person living in utter corruption and filth, they would say they live as somebody does in Corinth. That's how bad the city of Corinth was. Uh, one writer said this about Corinth and the depravity of this ancient city. He said that the Corinthians loved money. They drank deep from the wells and fountains of pleasure. They wallowed in the mire of vice. They rocked in the chair of voluptuous luxury, and they lived for things seen and temporal. This is the city Paul is arriving at in Corinth. Uh, he's arriving here after he's leaving Athens. Now, if you remember, if you know anything about Paul's missionary journeys, and even kind of the beginning of this text, when Paul was in Athens, uh, Paul's spirit was provoked. Uh, he was in Athens preaching to a city filled with idols and idolatry. Uh, so not quite the debauchery and the filth of Corinth, but a town that was given to idol worship. And as he was preaching Jesus in that town, uh, we see that uh, this town was filled with immorality. They had a, they had a temple in, in Athens, uh, the temple of Aphrodite, where thousands of prostitutes practiced their trade in the temple. So as he's preaching in Athens, facing all that, he comes now to Corinth in, in chapter number 18, and he gets to Corinth, and we notice Paul's kind of depressed. Paul's kind of like, dude, what is going on in my life? I just left Athens. I faced all the garbage in Athens. I faced all the trials and the problems and the, and the nastiness, and now I'm coming to Corinth, and Corinth is even worse. What is going on? And he gets there, and you get down to verse 9 and 10, and you see that, that, that Paul kind of had to be encouraged by the Lord. Paul had the blues. 
Paul was down in the dumps. You ever been there? You ever been discouraged? Come on. Uh, you, ever, you ever been down to the point where, uh, you know, you just felt like, man, no, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to sit in the garden and eat some worms. We've been there. You know, one thing I love about the Bible is this. The Bible is ruggedly honest about its heroes. It'll show you the good side of Paul, but it'll also show you the bad side of Paul. It'll show you the ups of Paul, but it'll also show you the downs of Paul, right? And that's what the Bible does, and it teaches. But, but here's the thing. When I get to verse number 9, and Paul is having to be encouraged by the Lord himself, it encourages me to know this. When I face my times of difficulties, when I face my times of discouragement or depression, when I face that time in life where I say, I'm just going to quit and throw in the towel, isn't it nice to know that the God who showed up to help Paul is the same God that we have today? And is the same God that will show up to help us get through our problems as well? I, I'm so thankful that I can, in one area of my life, identify with Paul. I may not ever be as great of a Christian or preach as good of a message or be as big of an impact as the Apostle Paul, but when I face depression and discouragement, I can, I can, I can uh, identify with Paul. And I can know that the same God is there to help me. Paul has the blues. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he's talking about this particular transition. And he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. Uh, Paul, was, Paul was struggling here as he made this transition. He was, he was dejected and discouraged and he was dispirited. He's down in the dumps because of you know, the, the rejection in Athens and then coming to Corinth. And it was even worse there. As you search Acts chapter 17, the passage right before this, and in the first few verses of what we read, I, I see about three reasons why Paul was down in the dumps. Uh, I want to give you three things here that I think discouraged Paul because we face these same things. And, and then I want to show you kind of how Paul responded and what God showed him, okay? Three things that discouraged Paul. Number one, number one was a sense of failure. A sense of failure. He remembered he had preached in Athens. Uh, he had preached in the synagogues. He would preached in the marketplace. He had been invited to, to Argopus and, and, and to stand upon the, the, the big stone there and argue his case for, for Christianity. He had preached in front of the philosophers and the Athenians. And you remember, as we read that passage of Scripture, the Bible says they laughed at him. They laughed at him. Uh, that, 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 you're, you're preaching about this guy who, who was killed. We talked about this a little bit last week with Paul. Uh, and now you're saying he's the resurrected Savior. You know, they called him an idle babbler. They called him crazy. Uh, they, Paul, they thought Paul was a madman. I imagine Paul probably felt like, man, the stone and I got in Lystra doesn't hurt as bad as the comments these people are making to me. These people hate me. He, he's down and out. He's discouraged. People are mocking him and mocking his Christ. You ever, uh, you ever been there? You ever just felt like, man, I'm a failure? Uh, dads, we'll key on us a little bit this morning, right? You ever been there? I failed in my marriage. I failed in my responsibilities to my wife. I failed at my job. I failed in my childhood. You fill in the blank. I feel like sometimes I'm a failure. We've been there. Paul's there. Paul has a sense of failure. I can't get through to these people. God is not working. I'm hitting a brick wall. What in the world is going on? You ever witness to somebody, try to tell them about Christ, and you just get stonewalled? I don't want to hear it. 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 And you leave like Paul did Athens. You leave with a sense of failure. And this discourages us, just like it discouraged Paul. I, I see a second thing, though. I put down this. I think there was a simple fatigue. I think Paul was tired. Paul was weary. Uh, Paul's on this journey. Think about it. He preaches on, in Athens on Saturday in the synagogue. He's in the marketplace on Sunday. From Monday through Friday, he's making tents as his, as his regular day job. Then he travels two to 300 miles from Berea to Athens, and then another 100 miles uh, from Athens to Corinth. When he gets to Corinth, he's plum tuckered out. He, he comes across the path in chapter 18 of this husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, he meets them. Uh, he's tired. He's weary. He, he kind of attaches to them. But we have found out this, and we, we know this kind of scientifically, but it's spiritually true as well. The body and the mind work together. And usually what happens is one clones the other. And when the body is tired, it's really hard for the mind to work properly. <laughs> it's hard to make good decisions when you're physically exhausted. You been there? And when you're mentally exhausted, it's hard to do physical actions. Paul's experiencing both these things just like we do. He's experiencing mental fatigue, physical fatigue. Uh, he, he's struggling with this. Have you ever noticed when you're tired... People really get on your nerves. 
Huh? You ever notice that? People seem extra stupid when you're tired, don't they? It, am I right? But, but here's the other thing. It's easier for you to get on other people's nerves when you're tired, too. And sometimes we push buttons on purpose when we're tired just because we're tired. Sometimes it's better when I'm physically tired just to keep my mouth shut, amen? I don't usually do my best thinking when I'm tired. I say things I regret and didn't mean to say. Uh, but the body and the soul work together. Uh, and, and so Paul's just, just plain tuckered out. He, he, he feels like he's failed. Now he's there and, and arrives in Corinth. He's fatigued. Look at this. I put down a third thought. How about a surreal frustration? Paul is just, just done. He's frustrated with people. You ever been there? Huh? You ever been there? I'm just done with people. I want to go lock myself in a room with a couple dogs and we'll be fine. Amen. Dogs don't talk back. Well, we have a few that do, but I have I have this little puppy. His name is Gus Gus, and uh, he's a little white and black Chihuahua, and uh, he's part Chihuahua and part Wiener dog. And he'll he'll climb up on your chest, and he likes to try to you know sneak that lick in your mouth. You know when you're not looking, he'll try to get you. And uh, my wife will have him up there, and he'll go to lick her, and she'll, she just pops him on the nose and says, "Pop." She says, "Pop, pop." No, no, no. And then she does that, and he'll come back, and she'll do it again. He has got to the point now where she'll pop him on the nose, and he'll take his paw and pop her back. <laughs> it is a blast to watch. I'm like, please get up on her and lick her. Please get up on her and lick her. I want to see this. It's pop, 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 pop. It's great. But anyways, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you that. Most of the time, dogs don't talk back, right? Paul is extremely frustrated. I think the first part of that reason is because the Jews were continually hounding his heels. Everywhere that Paul went from his first missionary journey, the Jews opposed him. Now he's on his second trip, and guess what he's found? The Jews are still opposing him. Everywhere he goes, they're, they're dogging his heels. Uh, and I can tell you this, when people are constantly after you, it does something to you. It wears you down. You can stay prayed up all you want to and for the most part handle any situation that comes. But there comes a time where you're just ready to punch somebody in the throat. Amen? This is Paul. He's tired. He, he felt, feels like he has failed. And he's just frustrated with all the, the negativity and all the opposition he's getting from the Jews. Everywhere he goes, they're out to get me and they're out to oppose me. But secondly, I think he's overwhelmed with this area of frustration because the overwhelming odds against him. He shows up at Corinth, and guess how many people are on his team to help him present the gospel? The, the gospel. <laughs> the gospel's like a hospital, right? Two. It's him and Aquila and Priscilla. Three people in a town of 700,000 people to try to reach them for Christ. I don't know about you. I look at that. That's, that's, that's invincible odds. I'm not going to I'm not going to overcome that. And so Paul is looking at this thinking, man, I'm outnumbered. I'm outgunned. Uh, this is frustrating. Paul gets a little bit depressed, a little bit down in the dumps, a little discouraged. And he shows it to us. The Bible shows us clearly. Paul's struggling right now. You know, I think about that today and I can't help but think there's, there's, there's somebody out here right now in this crowd looking at my ugly mug and you're struggling with your problems. Your burdens are difficult. What you're facing right now seems like an unbearable load. You're tired. You're frustrated. Uh, you, you feel like you have failed and you're tired of failing. And you're asking yourself a question right now. I don't know if I'm going to be able to quit, uh, continue this, am I? Am I, am I going to make it? Am I going to be able to continue this fight? And there's Paul in Corinth. Facing the exact same thing. About to quit. About to throw in the towel. About to say enough is enough. And you know what? He, he, this is encouraging to me. Because here's what, it, here's what it shows me. You're not alone, number one. And even leaders that God puts in our lives get tired and weary sometimes. Face, face discouragement at times. Paul did. Paul did. You're not sitting by yourself this morning. Elijah got the blues, Moses got the blues, uh, Jeremiah got the blues, Abraham got the blues, Isaiah got the blues. All these people in Scripture we say were great men of God. They all got down in the dumps and got discouraged. And just about the time in this passage of Scripture where Paul's ready to just say, you know what, I'm done. I quit. Here's my, here's my resignation, God. 
as Paul's about to sign the resignation, God steps in. And in verse 9 and 10, God speaks to Paul. And he says, I know what you're about to do. And I'm going to say this to you. It's too soon to quit. I got, I got more things for you to do. I've got more things for you to accomplish. I've got a, a more impact for you to make. I've got people that need to be reached. It's too soon, Paul. You're not quitting on me now. And the Bible says God came to him in a vision. Um, and he spoke to Paul. Uh, old country church used to say, God may not show up when you want him to, but he's always on time. And God showed up at the exact right time. He spoke to Paul, gave him the exact right message. And he did this throughout Scripture. He showed up to Moses on the backside of the desert. He comes to Isaiah when his hero, King Uzziah, died. Uh, he comes to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He comes to Paul here at Corinth. And he steps in and he says, hey, it's too soon to quit. It's too soon to quit. There's somebody in this room today that some area, some arena of your life, you may be contemplating. I think I'm going to quit. I think I'm going to quit. Can I just say this? In your desperate, most needed hour, God is there. And God has a message for you just like he did Paul. It's too soon to quit. It's too soon to quit. You may have to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You might have to drink the bitter cup. You might have to stand for right and face your Calvary. But I encourage you to know this. It's still too soon to quit. God has a plan for each one of us. And when I face overwhelming odds, like Paul did at Corinth, God is still there. And he says this, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. There are people in churches today that feel like, well, I've been serving God long enough. It's time for me to turn over the reins. Well, I feel like I'm not getting the help I need. I think I'll just, I'll just quit. Can I, can I just say this? It doesn't take much to quit. But it sure does take a whole lot to keep going on. Quitters are a dime a dozen. Quitting's easy. Amen? It's, it's, it's sticking to it that's hard. Uh, we, we know people that quit everything. And when it gets hard, they quit. I want to tell you this morning, as a child of God, don't quit. Don't quit. It's too soon to quit. Hard times come. And it's easy to quit, but, but, but hard times give us a time to just keep trying harder. Hang in there. Do you ever stop and think about this? If you belong to God and you're fighting a fight, you're in a fixed fight. Think about that for a minute. If you're God's child, that fight is a guaranteed victory. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Yeah, my, my, my dad's got bigger muscles than your dad. Amen. It's a fixed fight. It's set. I'm going to win. The child of, of, of the king always wins. Because Christ died on Calvary, he fixed the fight for us. He defeated every enemy we could possibly face, including death. He took the sting out of death. He took the victory out of the grave. It's a fixed fight. I got to stay in the ring. I may not get knocked down, but I got to get back up. I may get knocked down again, but I got to get back up. I may continue to get knocked down, but I got to keep getting up. The, vi the victory is assured. The, the battle is won. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I'm ready to throw in the towel. Uh, this, is, this, this marriage stuff, man, it's just... Mm. Uh, my job, these kids, I, I'm just done. Maybe it's a ministry. Ministry that you're working. Maybe it's a, a, a person you're witnessing to and they seem like a hard case and you're just like, you know what? I'm just going to quit. Can I just tell you what Jesus says in verse number 9? He comes to a vision to the Apostle Paul. Verse number 9, he says this. Be not afraid. Be not afraid, but speak. Speak. Hold not thy peace. We get told shut up enough, Right? We get told, stand down enough. We get told, hey, this isn't your place, child of God. You just fit in and be quiet. Mind your business. And, 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 and God comes to Paul here and says, it's time to speak up. It's time to not be quiet. It's time to not hold your peace. You need to pre preach the gospel of Christ. Uh, listen, God, God tells Paul this. He says, speak. Have some stick to -itiveness. Is that a word? Stay, stay with it <laughs> Just keep on keeping on. Don't quit. He turns around, though. Here, here, here's the encouraging thing about God. 
God tells Paul, don't quit. It's too soon. Keep going. But then he tells Paul in verse 10 why. He said, I'm going to tell you not to quit, and I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't quit. And here's the great thing. All these things apply to us today. Dad, you ready to throw in the towel? You got a husband, you got a stubborn wife? Hey, we all do. Learn to live with it. Amen? It's just part of life. And they're thinking, oh, you call me stubborn. Let me tell you how big of a knucklehead my husband is. I know. I know. <laughs> the kids at that point, you're like, man, get out and live on your own. I'm tired of we need, we need to realize whatever arena, whatever area, whatever thing we're thinking about, like whatever burns on our shoulders this morning, it is still too soon to quit because God has a plan. And, and God can see us through. And when I get discouraged, I need to look at verse number 10. And, and when God speaks to Paul, he gives him three reasons why it's too soon to quit. And, and I love these, and they're so simple, but we miss them so often. Three reasons. Number one, it's too soon to quit because of the promise of God's presence. I am with thee, he says in verse number 10. Don't quit. Speak up. Stand up. Shine your light. Stay with it. Keep going because I'm with you. You may feel like it's impossible. You may feel like the burden can't be carried alone. You may feel like everyone is out to get you and no one is for you. You may feel like this is an impossible task. Keep going. I'm with you. I'm with you. Boy, some of the greatest news we have in Christians is that today. I am with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you even until the end of the world, he says in Matthew. Even to the end of the world, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I know some of you, maybe you're uh, young enough that uh, you don't realize this, but everyone is going to come into a situation at some time in our life where somebody forsakes us. Somebody we thought never would. A husband might forsake his wife. A wife might forsake her husband. Parents might forsake their children or vice versa. Uh, your, your family might turn on you. Your friends might ostracize you. You might run into those situations where, uh, you know, you think, man, nobody is for me. Can I tell you this? God is. God is. David says in Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Isn't it nice to know that the God of the universe is on our side? And when I'm faced with situations that cause discouragement, and makes me even think, I'm throwing it in the towel. Isn't it nice to know there's the God of the universe that says, hey, just like I spoke this into existence, I'm going to go with you every step of your life. In every burden you bear, I'm there to help. In every tear you cry, I'm there to wipe. I love you. I love you. I'm with you. His presence. By the way, can I say this? His presence is not based on how you feel. It's based on his promise. You know, there are times in my life where I don't feel like God is with me. Y'all been there? Come on. There are times in my life where I feel like, man, I'm all alone in this world. Not even God cares about me right now. <laughs> been there? It doesn't matter how I feel. I have the promise of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse number 10, he just reminds the Apostle Paul, it is too soon to quit. You have not thought about my presence. Uh, you need my presence to overcome the situation. Here, here's, the pro here's why we need God. We have trouble interpreting problems. Am I right? When a problem comes, I immediately, my mind starts thinking of why this is happening. And I try to come up with some, some anecdotal theory. And, and hey, this is why, and this is how, and this is who. And, and this person starts, and, and the enemy's out to get me, and blah, 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 blah. And God just says this, listen, you ain't smart enough to know why I allowed a problem in your life. Let me interpret the problem. Let me interpret the problem. And so when I face problems, the part of this God's presence is so important because he's along there to help me interpret the problem. Because many times these burdens and these problems that I face are not the enemy trying to hurt me. It's Jesus trying to grow me. But i got to allow him to help me interpret that. The promise of his presence. The promise of his presence, he tells Paul. Secondly, he gives him the promise of his protection. He says in verse number 10, No man shall set on thee to hurt thee. No man shall set on thee to hurt thee. You know why it's too soon to quit? Not only do we have his presence, we have his promised protection. His promise protection. How many of you have a security system in your home? Anybody? <laughs> Besides dogs. Okay. How many of you have? Dee, 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 dee. All right. How many, how many of you have one? Let me see your hand again. 
okay, we won't rob her or her. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's only three or four of you. The rest of you have Smith & Wesson, right? I don't need no security system. <laughs> Come on, boys. <laughs> you have pretty good confidence in that security system, right? It's supposed, it's supposed to do its job, right? And, and for the most part, you set that when you leave, and you have confidence to go and protect your place while you're gone. Some of you have animals, you know, the dogs. It's amazing that some of the scariest barking dogs are the little bitty little lap, yappers, you know. Somebody comes in there, like, oh, they're going to kill me. He's just a little bitty dude. He's like six and a half pounds, you know. <laughs> they're the ones that will get your ankle and tear it out, though. <laughs> but, uh, you know, some of us say, well, I'm, I have, you know, I have the Second Amendment that protects me, and I, I have the right to bear arms, and that's my protection. Whatever the case it is, we, we try to protect ourselves. And again, we protect our valuables. Uh, we protect our, 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 our personal information. Amen. A bunch of scammers and thieves out there. We, we protect our family. We protect our, our health. We protect our, our physical body. You know, think about this. Paul said, or God says to Paul, uh, be not afraid. Now, would, would God say be not afraid to somebody who he didn't know was already afraid? Yeah, he knew Paul was scared. And so he's, there's no use to tell somebody don't be afraid if they're not afraid. He knew Paul was scared, and so he reminds him of his presence, and he reminds Paul of this, hey, listen, I'm here to protect you. No man can harm you. No man can harm you. Isn't, isn't that awesome if you think about it? No hurt can come to me unless God allows that, unless that's in God's divine uh, blueprint for my life. Uh, you know, I, can, can, I don't want to be mean. It's going to sound mean. It's going to come off as mean, but I don't want it to be. There are people today who say this. Well, I'll never get married again because I got hurt. Well, I, I, I will, I will, I will never have you know children because I, I heard how they were, uh, they were hurting, and, and my friend got hurt by him, and so I. I well, I'll, I'll never go to church again because that one I went to sixteen and a half years ago. They hurt me. Now, we laugh at that, but that's true. We, we get that today. I got hurt in church. You know what? That's, that's fine. I, I, I've gotten hurt at, at the restaurant. I still go out to eat. Yeah, come on. Either apply it all the way across the border, don't apply it at all. Amen. Well, I got, you don't understand. Listen, we, we, we don't do things in life many times because we're afraid we'll get hurt or we've been hurt before. When we've been hurt, we're aware of the danger and the problems and the pain of the hurt. I don't like pain. I don't like hurt. Do you? No. Paul had felt the whip on his back. He'd been hurt. He'd felt the stones ripping into his flesh. He'd been hurt. Uh, there, there are things we face in life. But here's, here, I want you to understand this. And don't, and don't take it the wrong way, but it's kind of true. You are immortal with God. Do you, do you, do you, I want you to stop and realize this. Do you realize that man cannot kill you unless God is ready for you to die? Now, again, I'm not saying don't protect yourself. I, I often carry, you know, carry and protect myself. I'm not worried about it. What I'm saying is this. If it's not my time to go, I ain't going to be taken. If you think about it, in all, in all, in all reality, I know I'm a mortal being, but I'm immortal as God's child because I'm not going until he calls me home. And it might be through physical, uh, physical. Assault. I don't know. It might be through a sin. We don't know what's going to happen. But it's not going to happen until God's ready for it to happen. I I'm immortal with God. Uh, check out the life of Paul for a minute. He was told by God, you're going to go preach in Rome. On the way to Rome, what happens? The shipwrecks. Uh, the people escape on boards and broken pieces and barely get their lives. But they, but they, but they all survive. They go to this little island there, and they float on these boards and these broken pieces, and they go to this little island there. And on the island, he gets bit by a snake. He'd already been stoned. He'd already been beaten. He'd already been imprisoned. Now he's got shipwrecked and getting bit by a snake to add to it, right? And, and, and what, is, what does Paul do when he gets bit by a snake? Oh, this is not fair. God, what are you doing? You know what Paul does? He shakes it off. <laughs> he shakes it off. No harm came to him from it. Why? Because God said this, until you accomplish my work and my will, you're immortal. <laughs> I'll protect you. Now, now let, me, let me clarify. 
I'm not saying go out and drink poison and say, well, God will protect me. No, that's stupid. Okay? God doesn't bless stupidity. Well, if I jump off this building, if God's not ready for me, okay, fine. You can live with broken legs the rest of your life. But that's up to you, okay? I'm not saying be stupid. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. Just trust God. He's there to protect us. And he says, Paul, when you're discouraged, don't quit because I'm with you and I am protecting you. But I like this one too. Look at number three. He also has the promise of possibility. The, prophes- uh, the promise of possibility. He ends verse 10 and he says, for I have much people in this city. Now let me, let me, say, let me, let me clarify that. He is not telling Paul, oh, there are scores of churches already established and they're on your side. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying there's a whole bunch of Christians that you don't know about there in hiding. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. I've got a plan for this city. And a whole bunch of people are going to come to Christ because of you. And you're going to see an army of God arise up in the city of Corinth because you stuck with it. The possibilities. The possibilities. You know, I I look at that and I think there are many times in my life where I think, well, God can't do it because I'm looking at the sheer reality of the numbers. It's three against God can't. You realize, you know, you know what faith is? It's believing in something we can't see. And, and God says, listen, uh, you, you, you don't, 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 don't measure victory by numbers. Don't measure victory for what you can see in your life. Let me just work. Trust me. Trust me. Can I, can I give you a real, real easy, simple illustration here this morning? And again, you, you know I'm not a... I'm not one of these TV prosperity preachers, you know. Send me your send me your fifty dollars seed, and I'll send you a prayer hanky that has wiped my sweat, and you will be blessed for the rest of. Your... I'm not one of those guys. Okay, I'm not a big money grubber. But but can I can I say this? I would get this is a quick, this is an easy illustration. Okay, do you know why many people don't give? Here's what they do. I'm, I'm just going to explain it. Here's what they do. They look at their pocketbook, and they look at their bills, and they say, "How in the world can I make this work?" And you know what God says? Don't look at the pocketbook and the bills. Look at me. Look at me. You give because, because it's, it's what I want. You give because I promise blessing for giving. And, and I'll take care of the rest. It's, it's all what we look at. And Paul's looking at right now. All I see is three people. Three Christians here in this big old town. What in the world are we going to do? And God says, listen. I've got a whole bunch more. They're going to come to Christ if you just stick with it, Paul. Don't. Quit. It's too soon to quit. Don't measure God by what you see. God says don't follow him by sight, but follow him by faith. I want to say this. We often place, uh, come to times in our life where uh, it's hard to hang in there. It's hard to think I'm going to make it, I'm going to survive. Can I just encourage you again? Hang in there. Stay in the ring. Keep fighting. It's working. Uh, you can't quit now. God's got the promise of possibility. You're a single mom, single parent, single dad. Hang in there. Hang in there. God's got a plan for your child. You know, think about it. You, you may be right, re- rearing the next uh, preacher of our generation. The next missionary that will have an impact on another continent. We don't know. <laughs> Maybe you have the next child that will be the next great president of the United States. Wouldn't that be nice? Amen? Hang in there. Wife. You're disturbed and troubled with your husband. <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. God's got possibilities that he's placed within your marriage that we haven't seen come to fruition. Let Hang in there. Hang in there. Husband, you're having a rough time at home? Hang in there. Just, just hang in there. Keep fighting. God's got possibilities we can't see. You're elderly today and you say, man, I don't know how much more God got in me for God. Hang in there. Hang in there. Just keep walking with him. Here's the thing. If you keep walking with him, he keeps walking with you. It doesn't matter what the burden you're facing is. My kids, Pastor, you just don't understand. I'm so tired. Hang in there. Hang in there. We have the promise of possibility. We know God is going to do something if we just don't quit. I'm, I'm glad... That troubles don't last forever. Amen. And I'm glad I got saved. And I understand that Christ is my Savior. And I'm born again. I'm away to heaven. I'm thankful for that. But you know what I'm, you know what I'm most thankful for? Our example of not quitting. You realize Jesus hung on that tree. To pay for the sins of an entire world. To who knew no sin become sin. 
to die for the same very people that rejected him, hated him, and put him on that, on that tree. He came for that. And you realize while he was hanging on that cross, they told him, Hey, save yourself if you're this great Messiah. You realize he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come down that cross of his own power and said, You know what? I quit. But you know what he realized? It was too soon to quit. There was a mission that needed accomplished. Uh, there was a, 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 a payment that needed to be paid. And I'm glad he didn't come down to save himself. He hung in there and he didn't quit to save me. If he had quit, I wouldn't be here today, neither would you. I'm thankful we can hang on to God's unchanging hand. Folks, again, I don't know the need this morning. I don't know who needed to hear this. I love the encouragement from the Apostle Paul. But I will say it again. It's too soon to quit. Don't throw in a towel. Don't, don't quit your ministry. Don't quit your serving God. Don't quit on your spouse. Don't quit on your job. Don't quit on your children. Don't quit on you fill in the blank. Keep plugging on. Keep pressing on. You may feel discouraged just like Paul did. But God reminds us. Here's why you shouldn't quit. I'm with you. I'll protect you. And there are so many possibilities awaiting if you'll just stay with me. In the days of the gold rush, there's a man by the name of R.U. Darby. Him and his uncle decided to do some gold mining. They bought their equipment and they toiled and worked and drilled for weeks. And after several weeks, they finally found a vein of gold in Colorado. And they harvested that little vein. They took it in and found out what it was worth. And they were so excited. And they came back for their second trick to continue digging and drilling and, and, and getting that gold. And they realized after their return that the gold seemed to have dried up. It wasn't there anymore. They got discouraged. They quit. They sold their mining equipment to a junk man, a man who collected junk for a few hundred bucks. Now, some junk men are not real smart. This man was opposite of that. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine, and he did a little calculating. And his calculations showed that where they were and with the equipment that this man gave or sold him, that a new vein of gold would be found three feet from where the Darby stopped drilling. The junk man became a multimillionaire. Darby later in life became a millionaire through the insurance industry. But you know, he learned a very valuable lesson. Don't quit too soon. Don't quit too soon. And folks, I'm afraid in our life and even in our Christianity, we quit too soon. When God's about to deliver the answer, we quit too soon. When we're down and we're discouraged and we don't think we can go any farther, we quit. Can I just challenge you, Christian? Listen, don't, don't quit. Don't quit. I don't know what you're facing this morning. You, you do. God does. But it's not time to quit. God has got a plan. God is with us. God will protect us. And God's got a future for us if we'll just stay in the fight. Don't quit. Man, I'm, aren't you glad Paul didn't quit at this particular passage? Things sure would be different, wouldn't they? Keep on keeping on. Don't quit. It's too soon. Keep on doing for God what God's asked you to do. Keep on bearing the burdens that he's put you in, knowing he'll see you through. Don't quit. Paul gives us some great encouragement here. Because I don't know about you, I'm often tempted. Amen? Often tempted, as I know many of you are. Let's not quit. Let's keep on for Christ. Men, Especially this morning. You know what the world needs to see? The world needs to see men of God who still stand, who still believe, who still don't quit, don't throw in a towel, don't cave to the pressure, continue to love their family, continue to rear their children. That's what, that's what the world needs to see today. Don't quit. It's too soon. Father, Lord, this morning I pray you'll uh, take what's been said this morning, use it to help us and to encourage us and grow us. Lord, I know many times we give up just before... You're ready to work or just before the answer to prayer is ready to come. And we quit too soon many times in life. God, help us not to be like these gold miners, these athletes. Leon Lett, Lord, help us to not quit too soon. Help us to continue pushing forward for the cause of Christ. And even when we face times of great discouragement, 
May we see this promise that you gave Paul and give to us, Lord, your presence, your protection, and the possibilities of, of greater things to come if we'll just stay in the fight. May we never quit on you, Lord, I pray. Well, thank you for that. We have heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. Uh, no one's looking. We're just going to have a brief invitation. We'll sing a, a closing song. We'll be done this, e- this morning. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, first of all, um, I, I'm, I'm, I am, uh, I'm, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven this morning. I'm a child of God. I've been born again. And if I were to die right now in my seat, preacher, I'm on my way to heaven. And I know that for sure. I'm not hoping. I know for sure. And it's not because I got baptized or went to church or did some good things. It's because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And preacher, if I were to die today, I know for sure I'm going to heaven. Would you do this? Nobody is looking. Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to rejoice with you. Good, good. Amen. Good. Hands all over the place. Good. You put them down. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I, I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'd like to know that, obviously. But I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to call your name, not going to embarrass you. But I would love to pray for you this morning. I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me, Pastor? No one is looking. Would you do this? Just slip your hand up, slip it right back down. I'm going to pray for you in just a minute. Anybody like that? I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? All right, thank you. Anybody? I'm just not sure. All right. One last question or challenge here. We'll, we'll stand and sing. What are you facing in life right now? And you said, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can go any further. I don't know if I can handle any more pressure. I don't know if I can deal with any more bad news. I don't know if I can take another step. I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. I'm ready to quit. Whatever situation you might be thinking of right now, the burdens you're carrying, a physical problem, finances, a relationship, I don't know. Would would you just give it to him today? you just give it to him he's promised his presence his protection and the possibilities of his continuing to work in your life we got to let him don't quit don't quit don't quit don't quit keep on keeping on for Christ maybe you need to get more involved in something because you did quit earlier take care of that now doesn't matter Maybe you stopped doing some things that you used to do for the Lord. Hey, come back to him today. He's there with open arms. And he's got a a ministry and a purpose and a plan for you as well. I don't know the need this morning, but as we close with prayer, sing our song. If God spoke, you need to do business with him. The invitation will be open. Father, bless our time now as we sing. We close this service. And Lord, if decisions need to be made, help us to make them. Uh, Lord, help us just to use the invitation, Lord, to settle anything that you may have pricked or stirred our hearts about this morning, I pray. And we'll thank you for that. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning? We'll close. Change my heart, oh God. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, that is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. it ever true change my heart oh God may I be like you amen I hope we can sing that and truly mean that this morning if we'll allow him to change us we'll be more like him amen and allow him to use us in his service this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer this morning. Uh, dads, don't forget, meet me in the lobby. If you're a visitor or guest today, I'll meet you in the lobby as well. And uh, we appreciate you being here with us today. Let's close with prayer. Terry, would you close this morning, please? Thank you, sir.